Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. We are joined by a a very special guest, and uh, I'm very honored to be uh, speaking with her. And for those of you who follow me on Facebook, you'll be familiar with uh, her memes that I've been uh, recently posting. And we're going to have a very good conversation about what is emotional intelligence. Uh, So welcome to the show and and, uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, Chris. Well, it's wonderful for you to have the time to speak with us. And would you share, uh, you know, with the audience a bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Yes, sure. My name is Aurorasa Sima and uh, for your listeners who are wondering, my uh, accent is a German accent. I lived most of my life in uh, Germany. Hmm. And now I am blessed to live in the United States. And I help people to raise their EQ and therefore their level of happiness and success. That's what I'm all about. So this is why I was really glad to be invited because after looking at the topics you talk about, you teach about, I feel that's a very good fit. Well, well, thank you very much. And, you know, I've done uh, some of the research on what you're talking about uh, in regards to the emotional intelligence. And honestly, this was the first time I'd ever heard of an emotional intelligence. Can you describe for us what, what is it and why do you find it so important? I am happy to because I feel it is the single most important set of skills and uh, traits that a person can have for happiness and success. And when I say happiness and success, to me, it's really the same. If you're happy, you're successful. There's Mm -hmm. no such thing as career success. Uh, If you're not happy, you're not successful, in my opinion. Right. Now, emotional intelligence just gives you the ability um, to be in control of yourself that doesn't make so much sense if you just hear it like that. But what it means is that I, I understand my emotions and I am in control of my behavior. So um, at first you might think, oh yeah, she's, she's not going to say something she regrets later. And that is a part of it. But what is also a very important part of it is I am able to not react to the past like we all do. Mm. You know, things that have hurt mm-hmm. us in the past changed our brain and they change the way we behave. That's happening subconsciously. We're not aware of it, but most of the time, most people create self-fulfilling prophecies and they're not even aware of it. So that is one part of emotional intelligence. And then, and that's one of the reasons why it's trending so much right now. It also helps you to influence others. So, I mean, you don't have to be in sales Every one of us is influencing others all the time. If you have a kid and you try to get it to be home before midnight, you have to influence them. So emotional intelligence gives you the ability to understand someone else, to understand his emotions and his motives. And that's very helpful. Everyone always has an agenda. 
and if you have a high IQ, you understand it, and you can respond to the person in a way that makes it more likely uh, for them to follow you. People with a high EQ, you can really say, are also more likable. They are often very good listeners. So that would be my rough description. It allows you to be in control of your own emotions, to understand them, and to be well, in control sounds negative, but it's a really bit, a little bit what it is. You can influence others and you can understand others, emotions and agenda. So when you talk about being in control of, of the emotions and the behaviors, are you saying then that we are able to change those emotions? We're able to, uh, you know, feel emotions by our, our own creation or, or are, are the emotions simply reactions to things? Emotions are reaction to things, but most of the time, especially uh, if you have a low EQ, um, a lot of other things influence, um, go into you the way you react. It could be the past, your own fears or other things that influence you. So you're not really responding to the matter at hand most of the time. For instance, let me give you a simple example, because okay. physical and mental, there's no difference. If you are driving on the highway in your car, in your closed car, and a fly hits the windscreen, you're going to blink, right? Right. Perhaps you're even going to back off. If you could think about it, you wouldn't, because it doesn't make sense. The fly can't hurt you. But at some point in your life, something has injured your eye or has hurt your eye, whatever it was. Maybe it was a piece of dust or maybe it was really a bug flying into your eye. And what your brain did back then is it created a neural pathway that automatically triggers a reaction whenever it thinks that something even remotely similar is going to happen to protect you. And the same is true for mental pain. And we all have felt mental pain. So what our brain does to protect us is it creates neural pathways that force us. Um, it's this reptile brain. So we don't have the possibility anymore to make a rational, conscious decision about things. We react. So uh, part of what you do is, it, it, does it revolve around helping us to learn how not to react in more of that negative way? You know, so how would we be able to say, all right, you know, I've created these neural pathways and, you know, it's based on, on my past. So how do I make them better? How, how do I respond to situations maybe in a more positive emotion? That's a very good question, and that's also a very good explanation. Yeah, I basically help people to make conscious decisions about the way they react again. That doesn't mean they can't re uh, react negatively, but if they do, they do so consciously after thinking about how they want to react, and they don't react to something that happened ages ago, so they don't limit uh, themselves. Yes, the way you do that is... And this is, this is probably the part I have uh, to explain most often. My training um, goes over nine weeks. And uh, a lot of the time people are like, what? Nine weeks? But others do it in seven days. Well, nobody does it in seven days. That's the thing. Emotional intelligence training, if you do it right, if you want lasting changes and you can benefit from it for the rest of your life you basically have to retrain your brain mm -hmm. and obviously your brain is not going to give up of what it considers a survival instinct that easily else you would long have been eaten by a bear because you didn't run away so <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah. very true but it is possible and a good example where you can see it with uh, physical um, fear is athletes you know, we all have this instinct to back off of dangerous situations. But if you look at uh, Cirque du Soleil, you are absolutely able to retrain both. 
the physical and the mental side, but it will take time. It's not going to be easier than learning how to ride a car, which is a pretty simple task. So, and um, several exercises, again, um, it's like 30 different exercises over a period of um, 90 days help people to remove unwanted neural pathways and form new ones. The reason why this is a little bit tricky and it takes repetition and staying on it is the neural pathways to the primitive uh, brain are really thick and sturdy, whereas the ones um, to the more intellectual part of the brain are thin. So. But once, um, once you have successfully retrained your brain, you will see more happiness, more success, not just in your business, but also in your personal life. And um, one other thing that I want to mention, um, the default mode of the brain. A lot of people have emotional intelligence books or they've even been to trainings, but they didn't see the change, the transformation they wanted to achieve. And what I do in the last 30 days of my training, um, a quick explanation, the default mode network of the brain, um, as soon as you relax or so not, if you sleep, just if you relax, your brain gets really active. And different parts of your brain um, get active remotely and they start to generate thoughts. So self-generated thoughts, and they are often um, they are often around negative bias, um, worst-case scenarios, negative experiences, and you can't help that. Now, um, the more we've been hurt in the past. Oh yeah, there's a good example. There was a family who nearly died in uh, because of an earthquake. And uh, researchers followed them for nine years and uh, did brain scans. And even after nine years, their brain was still different than before the um, earthquake happened. What the brain does is if, you're, if you experience pain, it's possible that parts of your brain become part of the default mode network that aren't supposed to be there. Just imagine the default mode network of the brain starts to turn on as soon as you relax and the part that's responsible for detecting danger becomes part of your default mode network. And that's what you see, for instance, in um, people with anxiety. So a different part becomes part of the default mode network and every time they relax, the brain creates, is looking for danger. Mm -hmm. So, and um, that's what we're addressing in the last 30 days. And we're doing this with mindfulness training. That's basically what I'm doing. That, that's awesome, especially, you know, with the mindfulness of, um, you know, trying to get us into the moment. Because, you know, when I think of the clients that I work with who are dealing with a lot of anxiety, you, you can really tell that there's some, you know, deep embedded fear in them. And based on what you were just saying, that seems to make a little more sense to me as to why I sense that, that there's some deeper, uh, you know, sense of fear in somebody who just has some generalized anxiety. Yeah, and the problem is whenever they, they can be as positive as they want. They can be, they can have the right thoughts, the right mindset and everything, but it doesn't help them if as soon as they relax, all of the negative thoughts that aren't even their own come to haunt them. So that's why um, in mindfulness, there's, um, they did tests and um, you can achieve something like an alternative state. You can change back the default mode network the people who were trained um, meditation experts or mindfulness experts, how you've, you've seen these people who walk over fire, right? Mm -hmm. Or who lie on nail beds. 
totally amazing. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> yeah. And um, one thing that mindfulness helps us with is just removing all parts of the perceived suffering that are not really related to the pain. You know, like for instance, if I have a headache, then the headache is probably 30% of the pain. But then I start thinking, oh no, last time it was four days, it's going to be a horrible day at the office. And this makes a large part of the suffering up to 70%. And this is why these uh, people can lie on nail beds. I mean, I would think like, oh my God, it, it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And I would have all sort of thoughts that are not related to the actual pain that isn't really that bad. So they're keeping their thoughts just based on the pain from the nails at this moment, not worried about what could happen to them, exactly. but just what's, what's happening to them at the moment. Exactly. And, therefore, and that's probably... A, but, yeah, go. So I was just thinking, I mean, that could be, you know, really a good analogy for all of us that when we're, you know, living through some emotional pain, would it be safe to say that we're doing the same thing, that we're projecting and adding more to our emotional pain than what is probably actually there? Absolutely, always. Part of what the default mode network does is also it loves to compare ourselves to others. I've once seen um, a, a picture of a yoga class that fits really good. It was like a yoga class. They were doing some meditation exercise. Everyone was on their mat. And then there were speech bubbles over each of the heads. One would say, oh, my God, I'm the only one I'm that's not relaxed. I over the second head, it would say, oh, I gained so much weight. I wonder what the others are thinking. And over the third head would be something like, oh, got to run to an appointment in 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, it's uh, in, every, in every aspect, whatever happens, if we are not trained, if we don't train ourselves with the help of someone like you or me, or you do, you coach yourself, um, your default mode network, your brain will always increase the perceived pain you're feeling. In physical pain, mental pain doesn't make a difference. And I believe that this is uh, the main reason why people don't successfully transform. Well, one reason is obviously that they don't um, stay on it. You can gain knowledge and uh, few days but then you still until you can turn the knowledge into skills into wisdom you have to keep training and repeating so that's obviously the first reason but the second is if we don't retrain our default mode network to uh, to aid us in whatever we want to achieve we're not going to achieve it because as soon as we relax as soon, well, you can say as soon as our, we're not busy with a cognitive task, like talking to someone, doing some math. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know the English word. Some math uh, exercise. And as soon as we stop, the default network turns on. In healthy people, as soon as we pick up the next cognitive task, it also shuts off. But... And I believe it's the same with you. I followed your topics. If someone is already depressed or has anxiety issues, the problem is that the default mode network shuts off way, way harder or hardly at all. So mm -hmm. this is why mindfulness exercises are very much underrated. A lot of people see it like a, zeitgeist type of thing like flower power but that's really not what it is it's really a success tool and a happiness tool 
Oh, most definitely. And, you know, what I, I've been very uh, pleased about is there have been some scientific studies that, you know, are recently uh, proving that mindfulness is scientifically effective, uh, you know, so that we can't just say it's something, you know, that's just, you know, very nice uh, to do or, uh, you know, it's a purely spiritual thing, but there, there is some science behind it mm-hmm. that backs up, you know, what people write about and definitely what you're talking about and, you know, what you do. So I, I do think that over the years, we're going to see more and more of this becoming mainstream, uh, you know, so. which really puts what you're doing. You don't think it'll go mainstream? No. It's always, it's a hype, then it's going away. I uh, first uh, learned about emotional intelligence in 1996. Since then, Mm -hmm. it was like three or four times a major trend. The thing is that whenever something is hyping, there's going to be a lot of, excuse my French, bullshit hitting the market that Mm -hmm. ranges from emotional intelligence for your car to how to um, talk to your horse, emotionally intelligent. And then people get so much wrong information that they turn away again. It's not very attractive to tell people, well, yeah, but it's going to take at least 90 days. Right. So they will always, it's like with diet pills. It's, I can't believe that they still sell this, um, Nobody would buy a diet pill that promises two pounds in two months. They're going to buy 20 pounds in a week. Even they know it's not happening. It's not realistic. So no, I don't think it's going to be mainstream. And if it's going to be like a washed up version, like yoga became Pilates, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but it has nothing to do with the philosophy behind yoga anymore. No, that, that's very true, and I hadn't looked at it from uh, that angle before, and and so that that gives me something to to think about, um, you know, and where this actually is going to be going, because things do come and go. Um, so, you know, I, I think though in finding, you know, what's working for people, it's important in in the work that you're doing, you know, to somehow make sure that the truth about it is is maintained and, you know, it's purity is is there so that it can, you know, can continue to help uh, people with their emotional responses and, you know, how they can cope with life. Yes, absolutely. That's our job. And one of the things is you and me, we have to be very careful about what we talk about even if it is true that mindfulness helps depressive people, helps with anxiety, um, we have to be very careful to talk about it. But um, I totally agree with you. We just have to, and I mean, at the end of the day, everyone is in a sales position in a way. We just have to tell people the truth. And that's what I like about you. I've looked at several of your articles, podcasts. You seem to have a very honest approach too. So you don't promise anything you couldn't back up. Right. And, and that does bother me when people make these promises that, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to make you, you know, whatever. That, that's not true. Do you know where the 21 no. day, um, I, I'm sure you've heard it too, uh, even though you don't say it. Um, people can make changes in 20 day, uh, 21 days. In mm-hmm. every, from Tony Robbins to everyone repeated it. I can't remember the name right now. It was actually a plastic surgeon. And this plastic surgeon discovered that 21 days is the recovery time after he did surgery, plastic surgery, like nose jobs, etc. And he even later tried to like position his statement the way it was meant He never said you can change your brain in 21 days, but it became so popular, so viral that everyone now thinks, well, 21 days. Right. So we just have to educate people um, to have realistic expectations. But I believe 90 days, 
120 days, what is that if you are going to live the rest of your life more successful and happier? Well, well, exactly. And, you know, I, I really believe that you hit the, the, the uh, nail on the head when you talk about, you know, the expectations, because that's one of the things that I do talk about is, you know, we need these reasonable expectations. And anyone is going to promise you anything that seems... Uh, too far fetched is probably true. You know, that the way that I've experienced life and also in working with my clients and the study that I've done, you know, you can have these techniques and, and mindfulness and meditation forms and anything else that you do, but nothing is going to give you a perfect life. Nothing is going to take away uh, some of your pain and suffering, and that nothing is going to you know, make you immune to any of that. So for people who say that they can do that, uh, you know, definitely need to be very wary of that. Mm -hmm. um, and actually my belief would be, you know, people who go through some pain and suffering actually uh, can grow more than sometimes people who don't have that, you know, that they can learn from that. Yeah, I think we shouldn't celebrate failure as much as we sometimes do, at least if, as, um, if you look at LinkedIn, it seems at the moment as a failure is the thing to achieve. Um, mm. I, I totally agree with you. And um, a good thing that mindfulness does for us is it helps us to accept pain. And that sounds mm -hmm. that sounds very passive, but... Um, it's really a good thing to embrace pain as what it is, a natural part of life, but also to not suffer more than you have to. Exactly. And um, as I said, it's, it's probably for a professional wrestler, it might be only 30% of the um, pain that you can remove uh, the thoughts like, oh my God, and probably they're not going to renew my contract now that I'm injured because he really has broken bones, but... Most of us, it's up to 70% of our suffering is unnecessary and can be removed. And we can learn to embrace the other 30%. Not, yeah, you said you can um, grow more when you have pain. Mm -hmm. And you said you did a study. Oh, no, I, I didn't do a study on that, but... You know, I, I think that if we can learn from our experiences and uh, learn through some of the emotional pain and suffering, uh, then when we kind of come out on the other end, I, I think we've grown and uh, possibly matured a bit due to the experience if we take it as a mm -hmm. learning experience. That's very, very true. And that's, again, a bridge to emotional intelligence because that's what helps us to take the pain in a constructive way and make something good out of it and not right. let it hinder us for the rest of our lives, which most people subconsciously do. It's like they have two failed businesses and then when they try a third time, they think they are positive, but they are not. They're thinking thoughts like this time, I'm not going to fail and they also have fears about oh, what, are going, what are people going to say if I fail again. And without knowing it, they behave in a way that they are going to fail. That's right. just, sometimes people think all of these topics, law of attraction, um, they are often perceived in a very esoteric way. And I'm not saying esoteric is a bad thing, but this is not what these things are they are pure facts they are pure science it's um sometimes people think the law of attraction it means they sit down and they think i want a ferrari and then if they don't have a ferrari after two weeks they say oh the law of attraction doesn't work but what it really means is that uh, there's so much more around us than we can see our brain wouldn't be able to process even a small part of all of the things around us. So what it does is it filters parts of the reality for us and we can change the filters in our brain. So yeah, that's, we can 
decide what we are going to attract with our thoughts. But that's all it is. We, we can change reality. We can just change which part we see. There are problems around us. There are opportunities around us. <clears throat> and we decide which parts we are going to see. Exactly. And, and I think that's a, a really good you know, message that if we can take that on a daily basis, uh, that's going to be helpful in and of itself. Um, if uh, people are interested in, uh, you know, the emotional intelligence and, uh, you know, the courses that you offer, what's the best way that they can get in touch with you? Oh, um, perhaps just my webpage. I don't know if you want to, you can post a link. Yep, I will definitely do that. Okay, and then uh, so we'll encourage people to go over to your website to learn more about you and learn more about, you know, what you offer. And I will definitely have that link for everyone uh, to be able to click through and, and find out, you know, about you. So I really appreciate your time that this has been, uh, you know, a, a wonderful and insightful you know, message to be hearing. And for me, it's really a, the, the sense of hope, you know, that just because our, our brain can be wired one way doesn't mean that we're stuck. And, you know, your, your message is really one of, of hope that we can make the changes and it's going to take some time, but we can definitely do that. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing and just, you know, that, that hope that you're giving so many people. I very much appreciate what you are doing. And uh, that was a fabulous um, summary. Um, you hit the nail. And thank you so much for having me. It, it was my pleasure. Okay. Have a wonderful day, Chris. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening. And have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.